Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to Let's Talk Dairy for today, the 14th of January. Um, today, Brian Hillard is going to be running the proceedings. We're running the Chagas Once a Day conference through the Let's Talk Dairy platform today. Brian is a dairy advisor in the Dungarvan office in County Waterford who has a major interest in Once a Day and has been promoting it for a long number of years. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Brian for to run the show for today. Uh, we have three excellent speakers who he's going to outline to you and I'll be taking the questions here, so I'll put in the questions through the Q&A at the, at the bottom of the screen. Thanks. So. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to our fourth annual conference on once a day milking uh, for the entire lactation. Um, the very first year we had this was 2018 and in the horse and jockey, and we thought we'd be doing well to have 80 people attending, but as it happened, there's over 200 is uh, more than capacity of the, of the, of the, the venue. And uh, each year since then, we've had it in the horse and jockey, and we've had well over 200 people attending. So that just shows the level of interest that is uh, growing in uh, once they're making for the entire lactation. Um, so, and as it stands, uh, I think there's well over 500 have registered for today's webinar. And um, I, I, I think we're, we're not here, I suppose. The reason we're having this conference is because we are getting more and more queries from farmers that want to go uh, making once a day that need more information, uh, need more support, uh, even to give encourage to do it. And we are not actually going out to recommend that every dairy farmer should make once a day. But uh, in certain situations, we would have maybe individually have advised farmers to, to take up the job once a day. But really, these conferences and the previous conferences have been uh, set up to help uh, and support uh, people that actually have gone making once a day and people that are looking to go once a day and um, to know as much as possible about it because it's, uh, the numbers are growing. Uh, we reckon there's approximately 200 farmers here in Ireland making uh, once a day for the entire lactation. And the numbers are growing every year, and I know that for a fact. Um, so we have three speakers. Um, we have, first of all, Dr. Ian Kennedy, based in Tagus and Moor Park, and Neymar has been doing research work on once a day making uh, for the entire lactation for the last number of years. And um, she also is doing some work on uh, part-time uh, once they're making in the springtime and also maybe for seven or 11 weeks in the autumn time. So the email will be up first of all. Then we have a, a farmer speaker, which is vital. I always, I always insist on having a farmer speaker at these conferences because you can beat the actual people that are actually doing the job themselves and they have the great experience. So our second speaker is Michael John Delaney. Michael is making 100 uh, black and white hostile infusion herd uh, on the leash Kilkenny border. And um, he's the first speaker we have, I think, with, uh, with the Black and White Herd at these conferences. And finally, then we have our third speaker, Dr. Nick Snedon from Frontier Co-op in New Zealand. And Nick will share his experiences of the Wednesday making in, in New Zealand. Okay, look, without any further ado, um, we'll start off. So, email with yourself. Thanks, Brian. Good morning, everybody. Um, so as Brian said this morning, I'm going to give you a research update on the um, experiments that we've been doing in Moorpark and Wednesday milking over the past number of years. Before I start, I'd like to thank the project team involved in this. Um, they are John Paul Murphy, Kieran McCarthy, Jonathan McGann, and Michael O'Donovan. So today I've split the talk into two. So the first half is going to look at full-time once a day versus full-time twice a day um, milking. And the second half then will look at more short-term once a day milking strategies that are available, I guess, to nearly every farm in the country. So if we ask ourselves a question, why would you consider once a day milking? Well, one of the main reasons is if there is difficulty sourcing labour for the farm, once a day milking can fill that um, gap. Also, some farmers would like a better work-life balance and once a day milking again fits the brief. Short-term once a day milking um, is, is very valuable um, tool to have, especially when you want to overcome issues with workload. Like when you hit the busy calving season, like we're about to get into now, and you might have difficulty sourcing um, labour for that short period of time. So say for a um, 12, 16 week period. There are lots of benefits to once a day. Um, internationally, I guess, you know, from the research that's been done, we've seen that there's been improved energy balance due to lower body weight and body condition score loss after calving, and then that can lead to improved fertility performance. Some of the potential drawbacks then of one today are a reduction in milk production and milk solids production. So in milk yield, we'd be looking at a reduction of about 22 to 24%, and then in milk solids, it would look, uh, it's about 20 to 22%. Um, one of the risks with once a day milking is an increased cell count um, and these factors combined may result in decreased farm revenue 
And from work that has been done um, in New Zealand, it has shown that, you know, if you start once a day milking, you need to start focusing on your costs from the very day so that, you know, you're, you're going to counteract that drop in production um, and um, the, the revenue. So just to look at the, the treatments that we had in place, as we say, there were a full-time once a day and a full-time twice a day herd. So at this stage, we have had these herds in place for two full lactations. We have used the same cows both years. In 2019, the average EBI of the cows was 164 and 70 euro of that was accounted for by fertility. And in 2020, it was 169 euro and 66 of that was accounted for um, by fertility. Now, the majority of the herd um, are Holstein Frisian and about 10% of them um, are Jersey Cross. We have the same proportion of heifers um, in, in both herds and in both years, so running at about 23-24%. Um, we have had a difference in the concentrate that has been fed to the cows in both years. So in 2019, we fed 450 kilos of concentrate um, to the cows and last year we fed just 330. Now, the amount of concentrate that we feed is dictated by the grass availability and the grass supply in the farm. So obviously last year there was um, a greater amount of grass on the farm and that allowed us to feed a lower um, concentrate amount. So just to look at the grass and the herd management then. So firstly, just to deal with the, with the milking routine. So this is a normal routine that's implemented in Park. It wasn't specifically designed for the once a day herd or anything. It's something that we've had in place for the last number of years. Um, and what we do is that all the cows have their, um, when they come in for milking, their teeth are stripped, they're pre-dipped, they're dry wiped, the clusters are put on, and then after milking, they're dipped again. We try to milk the once a day cows first, um, and when they're getting their concentrate, it's received all in one feed. So the concentrate input is the exact same between the once a day and the twice a day cows. So for example, if we were feeding three kilos, the once a day cows get it in the morning, the twice a day cows would get a kilo and a half in the morning, a kilo and a half in the evening. In terms of the grass and management then, um, and for us, this is a big focus um, in the study. So we try to target a post grazing height of four to 4.2 centimetres throughout the year. During the first grazing rotation, the cows are on 12 hour breaks, so they're getting fresh grass after each milking. And then from the second rotation onwards, they move on to 24 hour breaks, again, getting their fresh grass after morning milking. We always try to have high quality grass available for them. So our pre-grazing yields run at about 1400 to 1600 kilos of dry matter per hectare. And because we maintain the pre-grazing yield at that level, it allows us to get to those post-grazing heights of four um, to 4.2 centimetres. We walk the farm every week and um, put the data into Pasture Base Ireland. Those walks could be done twice a week during um, the peak growing season. And based on the output from Pasture Base, we take our decisions. So during the main grazing season, we'll constantly be cutting out surplus paddocks just to ensure that we are hitting that pre-grazing yield. In terms of the breeding season then, um, we're breeding for 11 weeks for both the once a day and the twice a day cows. So just to look at some results then. So this is looking at the milk yield um, from the 2019 and the 2020 lactation. So the twice a day cows in 2019 produced 6,268 kilos, whereas the, in 2020 they produced 5,846. The once a day cows in 2019 produced 4,456 kilos. And in 2020, the once a day cows produced 4,243. So if we compare them with in-year, we see that the once a day um, milk herd, that their milk yield was reduced by 29% in 2019. And then in 2020, the milk yield reduction was a bit less at 27%. If we move on and look at milk solids then, in 2019, the twice a day herd produced 511 kilos. And in 2020, the twice a day herd produced 505 kilos. The so once a day herd produced 696 kilos of milk solids in 2019 and 409 kilos of milk solids in 2020. So that was a 3% increase. Now, if you just remember, the concentrate input was different between 2019 and 2020. So in 2019, the cows had 450 kilos of concentrate and in 2020, it was 330. Again, if we look at the difference um, between the once a day and twice a day herds within year, 
we can see that milk solids yield was reduced by 23% in 2019 and only by 19% in 2020, even on the lower um, concentrate input. So for, the, for us, that's telling us that, um, you know, perhaps as international research has shown that the first year of milking once a day leads to the biggest decrease in milk production and then the cows start to recover. And a previous research would show that by year three, cows should be back to um, the levels that they were at, the production levels that they were at when they were on twice a day before they went once a day. So um, that remains to be seen in this experiment. Another question that we frequently get asked is, do heifers react differently when they're milked once a day compared to twice a day? And these graphs clearly tell us that no, that heifers and mature cows react the exact same, that the reduction in milk production and milk solids is the same whether um, it's a cow or a heifer. And we observed the exact same results in 2019. So it, it is clear that they do not react differently and there's no difference between the reduction in the heifers and the mature cows. As I said in the introduction, one of the, the key things with once a day milking is an increase in body weight and body condition score. So if we firstly look at body weight and the top line there, the darker green, we have the once a day cows and on the bottom line, we have the twice a day cows. And it's very clear to see that throughout lactation that the once a day cows were heavier. So on average across the lactation, there was a 50 kilo difference in body weight between the once a day and the twice a day cows. And by the end of lactation, that difference was about 70 kilos, um, with the once-a-day cows being heavier than the twice-a-day cows. The exact same trend was then seen in condition score. Um, so again, the once-a-day cows were in better condition than the twice-a-day cows throughout lactation. So the average condition score for the once-a-day cows last year was 3.41, and for the twice-a-day cows, it was 3.04. And you can see there that there is a large um, difference at the end of lactation between the two herds and about half a condition score um, was the difference between them at the end of lactation. Cell count um, is, is another um, issue that, that you know, frequently is a question that comes up in relation to once a day milking. So in 2019, we found no difference in the somatic cell count between the once and twice a day cows. Um, you can see that the, the once a day cows were 204 and the twice a day cows were 199. However, last year, there was a small issue with the parlor at the start of lactation and that caused um, an increase in the cell count. So um, the average for the year was 344 for the once a day cows and for the twice a day cows, it was 147. So, you know, it could be a combination of issues between the parlour and the once a day milking. And um, that's something that we have to investigate a little bit more. Similar to 2019, the fertility performance of the once a day cows um, was really good. You can see here the, the once a day cows, their, their conception to first service was 88%. Their calf into conception was 81 days. And only one cow was not in calf, which was 4% of the herd. In comparison, the twice a day cows, 69% um, of those cows conceived to first service. Their calf into conception was 87 days. And by the end of the breeding season, um, five cows were not in calf, which was 9% of the herd. So another issue that we wanted to look at this year, um, and we linked up with our colleagues in the food centre, was to look at the milk possibility of once a day milk versus twice a day milk, particularly in late lactation. So this was um, milk that we collected between the 5th of October and the 30th of November um, last year. And we just wanted to see, like, you know, the low lactose is often commented on as an issue with, with once a day um, milking. And we wanted to see did that impact on the possibility um, of the milk. So basically, did it affect the cheese making um, ability of, of the milk? So the good news is that overall, there was no negative impacts of once a day milking on the milk possibility. In fact, um, once a day milking seemed to improve the cheese making functionality and it improved the milk heat stability um, of the milk. You can see the graph there of lactose um, and the work that the food centre did showed no apparent relationship between low lactose content and the bulk milk possibility, which again is another very positive um, finding. However, it should be noted that um, our cows were in very good condition. So both the once and twice a day herd had a condition score of over three and they were offered high quality grass. So even though it was the last rotation, the pre-grazing yields were 1,600 to 1,800 kilos of dry matter per hectare. 
and the, the cows stayed out um, for the duration of, of that part of the study. They, they weren't indoors on, on grass silage. So just to summarize the full time once a day versus twice a day milking um, and, and what, what, what we have found from it or what we think. Once a day milking may not be suitable for everyone. It depends on, on the farm or the person's circumstances. It may be suitable um, where there's large herd sizes um, or there's two herds where cows have to walk a long distance or where a person wants a better work-life balance. But as you can see from the results, um, we got a good medium production performance from the cows and that was on a low concentrate input of 330 kilos of concentrate. But like this comes with a word of warning that you know, once a day isn't going to fix your problems um, overnight. If you want to go once a day milking, you need to be extremely technically efficient. You need to have excellent grass and management skills because you only get one chance in the day to, to get it right. Um, so you need to have those low pre-grazing yields and you need to have um, the, the swords grazed out to 4.2 centimetres so you get good quality grass coming in the next rotation. And overall, good herd management um, is essential, particularly to keep on top of um, cell count. So if I move on then, and just um, if we briefly look at some of the short term once a day work that we have been doing over the last number of years. So we have had this research program in place um, since 2018. In year one, um, we compared twice a day milking uh, to once a day milking for four, six or eight weeks at the start of lactation and looked at that in terms of immediate and total lactation performance. Then in 2019 or in year two, we compared twice a day milking to full time once a day milking and also to once a day milking for two, four, six weeks at the start of lactation, again on immediate and total lactation performance. And then last year, we compared um, twice a day milking to full time once a day milking. And this time, instead of looking at early lactation once a day milking, we wanted to look at um, late lactation once a day milking. So we um, went once a day from either seven or 11 weeks before dry off date. So I'm going to more focus on the, the late lactation today, but just to give you a summary of the early lactation once a day. And to be honest, we think this is something that has a role to play on nearly all farms um, across the country. Like we're coming into a very busy season now, um, you know, and if you just had to milk the cows once a day, it would free up an awful lot of time. If you were to go once a day milking, what happens? Well, there is an, um, an initial reduction in milk production and milk solids yield. So you're going to um, reduce your milk yield by about 22 to 24% compared to cows that are milked twice a day. And the milk solids will be reduced by about 20 to 23%. However, when those cows return back to twice a day milking, their milk production immediately increases. So by the time you get to the end of lactation, there's no difference in the total lactation milk solids yield. We did find a reduction in milk yield when we um, went once a day milking for six or eight weeks in early lactation. There's absolutely no difference in cell count between um, any of the treatments. Um, and again, as you would expect, we did find a reduction in the labour involved. So in terms of milking time, and that's just cups on time, it doesn't include droving time or washing time, anything like that. The milking time was reduced by 30%. So clearly, you know, it there is an option that's available for farmers. Say, for example, if you went once a day milking for the month of February, um, you know, the maximum amount of time some cows are going to be on it is, is four weeks, and some cows might be only on it for, for a couple of days. But it, it'll give you um, great freedom in that, you know, for if you milk it once a day in the morning, in the afternoon, then it frees up time to maybe feed calves or clean out sheds or, or just tend to other jobs. So following on from that early lactation once a day work, we then wanted to ask the question, is late lactation once a day an option, you know, to give farmers a break towards the end of lactation. So um, in 2020, we compared twice a day milking with once a day milking from 11 weeks before dry off and seven weeks before dry off. So we had chosen our dry off date as the 8th of December. Um, but we knew some cows weren't going to make it that far. So we needed to implement some decision rules for drying off. So the decision rules we had were if cows were milking less than five kilos a day, they'd be dried if they were within eight weeks of calving. If their condition score was less than 2.75, but they were still, but they were within 10 weeks of calving, they would be dried off. Um, 
if they had a mastitis um, event and they were treated and their SCC didn't reduce following that treatment, they would be dried off. And again, um, if they had two consecutive cell count readings of over 500,000, they would also be dried. So just to look at the last 11 weeks of lactation in terms of the milk solids production. When we um, went once a day milking for 11 weeks from the end of lactation, there was a 24% reduction in milk solids over the last 11 weeks. Now, when we just did seven weeks, um, the milk solids yield was reduced by 26% during that seven weeks, but over the whole 11 week period, it was only a 7% um, percent reduction. And I guess the critical thing, um, or the critical question to ask is, what effect did it have on total lactation yield? And the answer is it had no effect. There was no difference in total lactation milk yield. There was no difference in total lactation milk solids yield. So you can see from the table um, below here that all the values are pretty similar to each other. So again, by going once a day um, for a short period of time in late lactation, it's not having um, a, a big effect, but it is giving you extra free time. I guess um, one of the questions and one of the things you'd always be mindful of is um, somatic cell count, particularly in late lactation when you go once a day because the, the, the volumes of milk are, are so low. So late lactation once a day milking did increase somatic cell count, but what we found was that there was an initial increase in cell count and then it seemed to reduce um, after a couple of weeks. However, over the whole period, it was significantly higher than the twice a day group. And it should be noted that the average cell count before, the, before we went once a day milking was 177. So it just shows you that you need a low um, cell count before you, you go once a day milking in late lactation. So from this work, our summary is that, um, as I just said, you need a low cell count um, before you practice late lactation once a day milking, and you need good management practice with it. We did see the increase in cell count when we switched to one state, but it reduced again after that. Um, the good news was that there was no difference in total lactation production. Again, good grass and management is essential. And I think that's the key thing to take out of today, that whether it's full-time once a day or short-term once a day, good grass and management um, is essential for, for either, and including grass in the diet for as long as possible. So particularly in late lactation, keeping those cows out on high quality grass um, for as long as you can. And of course, there is um, labor saving with, with once a day milking, even on a short term basis. And to summarize, um, from all the work that we've done so far, we would see short term once a day milking as having a role um, on all farms, whether it's in early lactation or late lactation, it's something to consider, particularly now as we're entering into um, a busy spring calving season. Okay, thanks Brian, that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much, Emer. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, not just on, not just on, on once a day for the entire lactation, but also for the part time um, part time once a day milking, which actually more and more farmers are, are doing um, for the, for different reasons. Yeah, there's a lot of questions after coming in, Emer. I'll just um, try. We'll, we'll we'll take a few now, and just to let you know the audience as well that we'll take a few questions after each speaker, and <coughs> when all the three presentations are finished, we will take questions to all three speakers, and we would hope and we would intend to finish the conference by. Um, by one by eleven thirty. Okay, just to fill you in on the time there. Okay, Emma, there's a few questions here that I could group together. One is, um, is there a difference in forage requirements between once a day and twice a day herds? And if so, how much? Uh, is there a possibility of higher slightly stocking rate on once a day? And your farmers will go once they increase cow numbers to compensate for, for lower production. So it's all about can you carry more cows if you're going making once a day versus twice a day? So um, the, the simple answer that, so this year, Brian, we, we actually did some um, intake runs with, with the cows to look and see if there's a difference in the intakes um, between them. Um, those samples still have to go um, to, through the lab. But looking at, say, the herbage removed, um, you know, we'd, we'd uh, measure the grass before the cows go into the paddock. And again, when they come out, there was no difference in herbage removed, which is telling us that there was no difference really in their intakes. Um, and to that, that would make a little bit of sense as well, because when you see the increases in weight and condition score, um, they seem to have like a good intake and they're putting that extra energy towards putting on um, weight and, and, and condition. So I don't think um, it really allow a greater stocking rate um, or, you know, it would change your, your 
forage requirements that much. So, so the difference is that once the egg cows uh, put, uh, put the feed, they're not putting into milk, they put it on their own condition, and I suppose substantive health benefits and fertility and, and uh, cow condition at, uh, at drying up. Very good. I'll say that, that'll be confirmed when we get the actual um, intake results back later on in the year. Yeah. Uh, we, we, last, we, we were talking to, to Nick there, Nick Sneddon, the other night on, on Zoom, so uh, it's a question I put to Nick himself about, um, about the stocking rates on once a day, so Nick, Nick can cover that later on again. Um, another question, would the parlour issue affect uh, twice a day had as much as they did um, as the once a day? Um, and uh, what, what was the average milking? Sorry, yeah, that, we'll just take that one on the, on the mastitis issue, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it, 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 did, it did affect them as well, and that's why I was saying we need to do a little bit more investigation into it to see, um, like to disentangle it basically, was it a parlour effect or was it a once-a-day milking effect? I think um, some of it was like just a once-a-day milking effect that the, the cell count was increasing. And, and did it affect it twice they had as much as it affected the once-a-day? Um, they, they were both affected similarly, but I guess you're only right. seeing the once-a-day cows once-a-day, whereas you've seen the twice-a-day cows twice. All right, and uh, just to take one more question here. What was the average walking distance for the, for the once-a-day herd or even the furthest distance? Uh, it was less than a kilometre, so it, it was quite it was quite short. Um, the area that we were using, the parlour was in the middle of it. So, yeah, that is uh, one of the things that the cows didn't have that far um, to walk. Okay, very good. Thanks, thanks for that, Hamer. Um, so, look, we'll take other questions later on and we'll move on. So, to, um, to Michael John Delaney, uh, as I said earlier, uh, a black and white herd, dairy farmer on the borders of uh, Leash Kilkenny. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be on Michael's farm there uh, twice with, with discussion groups. And I think, I, as I said at, at, the, at the outset, I think it's the first time we've had a black and white herd here. The, the majority of herds in the country would be black and white. Um, but maybe a lot of the people that are at once they're milking are, uh, are crossbred herds. So look, we have an opportunity here today from a man that's milking a black and white herd and doing a very good job on it. And uh, Michael, over to you and uh, to give us your reasons why you started started once, uh, milking once a day, uh, when you started and how you're getting on on it. Okay, listen, thank you very much, Brian. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope everybody can hear me and I sound pretty okay. Um, yeah, perfect. I'm going to go on this speak now for the next 10 12 minutes just give you a quick outline of my farming story so far and how a change of system has pretty much uh, probably changed uh, my outlook and uh, perspective on dairy farming so obviously as i said uh, my name is michael john delaney i'm farming outside durham in the county of leash so just to give a brief introduction um to uh, what i'm at doing here so i'm home farming since 1996 um i came home to a relatively traditional farm of the area Possibly 100 acre farm with uh, 25 cows raising all calves to beef. We had 30 early lambing yews and we grew about five, six acres of barley for our own use. And obviously, when I came home, I realized that I needed to concentrate on the dairy side of the business. So, gradually over time, I built up cow numbers and got rid of other farm enterprises. So, by 2011, 2012, we were running 90 cows, keeping 20 calves, 20 replacement heifers on approximately 100 acres. But obviously the reason I'm here is because since 2013, I've been milking those same cows once a day. And uh, over the next couple of slides, I hope to explain how my journey um, to get to the point of today um, went along. So just to start, just to show you, just to talk about what I have on site at the moment, currently farming 45 hectares of land. Um, I have 100 um, black and white cows to calve down in the spring. They're a combination of Holstein cross British Frisian cows. This is a kind of medium to clay soil, soil type around here. So it kind of gets me a first week of February, first week of November grazing season. It's quite a fragmented farm, as you'll see from a future slide. Um, got a bit of walking and there's a bit of up and down as well uh, out there. Since 2019, I've uh, started contract rearing out my heifers. So now this is strictly just a cow farm. So it makes the operation of the farm a lot more straightforward. Physically on the farm, I've got a 10 years herringbone parlor and I've got 120 cubicles. And I would hope in the next 12 months or so to hit a target of 110 cows to maximize the ground a bit better. So obviously, in a word, so this is a little map, small bit of artwork uh, last night, but basically the purple are fields. Obviously there's a lot of internal divisions taken out now. There's not that many ditches. The little red dot is the farmyard. As you can see, it's, nestled right there in the corner of a four crossroads. The black lines are public roads 
and the green lines, I hope you can see them, are public laneways that I've used down through the years to get cows access to different fields throughout my time. So obviously, up to 2011, 2012, you're thinking, I've got a relatively straightforward system. Why would I need to change it? But that is what I did. And the reason I did, as you can see from the map, is that it was a whole combination of a lot of little things kind of came together. I didn't have one particular moment. That public road was deteriorating quite badly over time. It was the road surface, road surface was quite poor. There'd been quite an increase in road traffic in the area due to the boom of the economy and also a lot of new one-off houses. And obviously, of course, by default, as I increased my cow numbers, I started reaching on the next field and the next field to increase my milking platform to give the cows more access to grass. And obviously, I got better at grass because I got to have longer grazing seasons as well. So I needed more ground. That by default then, of course, led to quite an increase, I suppose, put a lot of pressure on cows in terms of both cow fatigue and cow lameness. In 2011 and 2012, um, both 68 and 70 of those 90 cows had actually had to be hoof paired during the season. So again, that too, along with the walking, led to quite working days because you're working around traffic, etc. And to be honest, um, by 2011, 2012, the balls had really kind of gone out of the job for me. I felt I was doing lots of work, but not really making lots of progress. So what happened? So I attended, I ended up on a farm walk in October of 2012 on the farm of Michael Wall and his daughter Gillian and her husband Neil O'Sullivan in Dungarvan. And I suppose that really was my eureka moment when I realized that there was another way to milk cows. And I thought that's a system that might actually work for me. So I decided that next season come around, that's what I do. So cows started calving in spring 13. Uh, I chickened out, I couldn't do it. Um, put the cows out to grass, just carried on as normal. Then kind of ran into March, cows started to get lame again. And I thought I really couldn't stomach another year of it. So I was doing 12 hour blocks at that time. I went up to get the cows at four o'clock, but instead I took down the tread, gave them their evening allocation of grass, turned around, walked home. And although I looked back a few times as I walked, at, walked home, the cows said grazing and I said walking. And really after that then there was really no going back and the decision was made. So obviously I've tweaked milking times and different that different things over the year, but now my, I try and be milk, start milking by about 7.30 in the morning because I need to be off the road by about 7.15 because at that stage traffic is just picking up too much and you're just getting to too much trouble. At peak milking, it takes about two and a half hours to milk those 10 rows. Uh, typical day, now it has a lot of, it varies a lot for me, but up to dinner time, I have all my dairy jobs completed. So the afternoon then is, is left to me then to do other jobs around the farm. But, it, but once a day has given me great flexibility to um, finish when I need to on different days. It's a quick snapshot of cows. Um, what they look like. So obviously figures, that's pretty what everybody wants to hear about really when they ask about once a day, what have you got? So obviously, as you can see, 2013, I think the most important line for everyone is line four. Cages and milk solids in 2013 fell to 290 kilos. They had been 375 in 2012. But as you can see for the last three years, I've been kind of running, touching off 400 kgs of milk solids. So the cows have bounced back it's also probably a reflection, the slight change of emphasis on uh, breeding. I'm now breeding um, more Alzheimer's infusions with a greater emphasis on milk solids and fertility. So you can probably see the general rise, of course, from milk fat and protein percentages there from left to right. It's also on the rise. SEC is held quite solid for me. I think it's quite happy with it. It's a good number for me. Herd EBI, again, similar probably just a reflection of the breeding in the herd because I'm breeding from within the herd, probably the transition is a little bit slower than maybe some people would like, but the last number of years, um, it's starting to come through quite strongly. And the most important line really from here for everybody really is six week calving rate. That has improved immensely. I'm bobbing in around 85, 90% most years. That's up from about 50% in 2011, 2012. And that, those figures there are really allowing me to have the kind of production performance that I'm getting on this farm. And this is just a little snapshot of the cows, of the overall herd, herd EBI. 
as you can see, um, overall milk is not huge at minus 54, but I think there's quite a good ratio, 30 euros for milk and 79 euros for fertility. That's a reflection of the cow breeding. Overall EBI, 135. Probably this shows better. These are the 26 girls that are going to calf down next month. So as you can see, the breeding has kind of come through. Milk has definitely increased. There's plus almost 14 kilos of protein butterfat. Um, milk EBI is around 50 euros, but still a good emphasis on fertility, holding up there at 80 euros. Their EBI, 169. So realistically, I think I'm probably sitting on a lot of potential that I probably haven't realized just yet, but I think it's it will show, show through very shortly. Financial performance, again, a bit of a bugbear for everybody. Um, six, 700 euros per cow. I'm quite happy with this performance. Um, I think the system makes plenty of money. 2018, obviously, was a year um, of extreme weather for people. I think it just highlights the fact that the system was actually quite resilient, even in a tough year. Uh, milk solid, milk uh, co-op price, 38, 37, 39. Um, that just reflects the higher protein fat percentages that I probably have. So I'm constantly running a couple of cent higher than the, the general co-op. Oops, sure. Um, so, so anyway, so generally to summarize, um, what would I say? That, look, in my journey, um, I didn't change over the most fantastic herd of cows. It was a relatively straightforward herd at the time. Um, and I would say, listen, everything that I've done is attainable. But as you've seen from Emer's slide earlier, you still have to concentrate on all the little things. That takes a lot of hard work to get to the point of where you want, where I am now. You know, without a doubt, I think a good twice a day cow can easily be a good once a day cow. But you've, as I said earlier, and as Emer has said, um, you've got to concentrate on your milk solids and your fertility. You cannot drop the ball there, and you've got to concentrate. I think on high EBI stock. It does reflect itself in my performance and my figures down through the years. Because I'm the reason I've actually got selected to speak here is because obviously I firmly believe that a black and white cow has definitely a role to play in the once a day system. And I think once a day offers fantastic flexibility um, for both farmers and farm families, you know, both professionally and personally, you know, I mean, without a doubt. Um, and as I said, like for me, it's been an absolutely life-changing experience. I think about farming differently. I make plans differently, just that the buzz is back in the job. And I do appreciate that not once a day and full once a day milking is not for everybody. That maybe it's just a little bit you dip in, dip out. But I would just say that don't dismiss it. I'm not naive to think that every household would be, and every member of every household who would be totally in love with the fact of people suggesting they want to go once a day milking but I wouldn't dismiss it or are part of it at any stage. And to be honest, if anyone listening today is thinking about changing, I'm that voice in your back of your mind saying, go and do it. You know what I mean? Um, so listen, that's been my presentation. Um, quick snapshot of cows, just out of curiosity, if it does show up, this is one of the nearest paddocks right at the road and that little strip of green under that wooded area, that's the farthest away paddock if you can make it out. So that's kind of a father Ted moment of near and far away. You know what I mean? Um, I'd like to thank you. Just I'd like to make a few thank yous just to, for this morning. I'll just, on behalf of myself and my once a day discussion group, I would like to thank uh, Brian Hilliard, our drugs advisor. He's been our go-to man for the last number of years. So I want to say thanks to Brian for all his work. Um, I'd like to thank my own once a day discussion group uh, for all their positivity and enthusiasm throughout the years. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, Pat Mullen, my own drugs advisor, for putting together today's slideshow for me. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, I hope I wasn't racing through it too much for you, but if you have any questions, fire them at me and I'll do my very best to answer them as best I can. Uh, Michael, John, uh, I compliment you on such an excellent presentation. Um, you are so clear and, and uh, it's so easy to follow. You're getting a great picture of what you're doing. Uh, it's now your ninth year going into one stay milking. And, um, uh, and not just uh, on the physical side of the farm, but also give the human story side of it, which, which is a, 
which uh, happens to be important to a lot of people um, and, and maybe the reasons for going on stay making as well. <clears throat> now, we've a lot of questions as, as I expected. Um, I suppose just to recap there again, on, on your ICBF, it will then be a report up to the end of November, January, November 2020, you've delivered 390 kilos of milk per cow to the co-op, um, which is pretty close to the overall average of all suppliers to Glen Beer, uh, who would be, would be obviously the major, vast majority of making twice a day. So that's an excellent performance, uh, and you achieved that with a, with a 471 fat and a 384 protein. And also, you have five centiliter extra over the average milk supplier because you're higher fat and, and protein. Uh, that five cent actually is quite what is worth quite a lot, and it helps to bridge the, any gap that's there behind the yield of twice a day and once a day. Okay, um, just some um, just some questions now there for you. Uh, in the beginning, Michael John, was there was there um, a higher calling rate due to cell count? The CC. Um, surprisingly not, uh, Brian. It was quite unusual. I was looking at it last night, the numbers. Uh, my cell count in 2012 was actually 205, and my cell count in 2013 was actually 206. Um, in a weird way, I think actually um, the layout of my farm, I actually took an awful lot of pressure off cows um, with all the walking and the lameness, you know what I mean, on them. So I think that probably could have attributed to um, help, help on the SEC front. Um, after that, um, I would have. I don't have. I haven't called anything more unusual than anybody else. You know what I mean. I've just taken. You know, I mean, I, in the past, I wouldn't have concentrated as much on um, calling for mastitis and bacteria because, for simple reason, that if a cow could walk, I had to keep her, regardless of what trouble she was giving me. So um, I didn't really have any choice. Um, but no, it, it's, it hasn't been any worse than anybody else. I didn't call anybody deliberately for cell count craze in the first year or two, I don't think. No, just natural, what everybody else does naturally, actually. Very good, Michael John. Um, uh, another question here is, what is the herd's replacement rate? Uh, generally, I've been keeping uh, about 20% uh, replacement rate. I was only able to keep about, uh, up to 2019, only able to keep uh, 20 heifers anyway on the farm due to um, nitrogen soccer because obviously I had stopped it predominantly with cows. So I was limited to only having 20 heifers, which is about 20, just over 20% on a 90 cow herd for such a long time. I only got the, my land area only increased in 2016 from 38 hectares to 45. And obviously only in the last two seasons have I been able to contract out to heifers. So that has allowed me to keep more heifer calves because I can give them to the contract rare than I normally have. 20% um, is a reasonable uh, replacement rate, I think. Obviously, I probably could do it a little bit. You could take a little bit more, but then I hadn't done the same work um, before I changed over in terms of maybe uh, mastitis and cell count. And obviously, of course, the other trick is I'm also changing, not only am I changing cow system, but I'm also changing my cow breeding set, my cow type. So to change two things is probably a lot to change over. So you probably could take a few more replacements, but I probably nursed a few cows along the way that maybe other people wouldn't, but you could probably could take a 25%, you could have 25% heifers there just to give you the option, especially if you're doing two jobs, which is changing cow system and cow type. Very good, that's, that's excellent, yeah. Um, I, 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 you did say there, I know that you, you set off back nine or 10 years ago, you had a, a very much a British region type cow, so you have, you have made strides uh, Put more milk in that herd, I suppose, uh, and, and maybe been down cow size a bit also. So and, and obviously you're getting there with the yields you're now getting. Um, just to, maybe just to quite have it there, a quick question back for Emer as well. Give you a break there for a second, Michael John. Um, Emer, uh, will late lactation once a day be viable in the context of selective dry cow therapy, <clears throat> therapy coming down the tracks? And was selective dry cow therapy carried out on any of those cows, any, any of the once a day cows in last autumn 2020. Yeah, so those, those cows are actually um, assigned to a, another trial as part of Claire Slabby's PhD. Um, some of them are getting selective dry cow therapy. Some of them um, are getting antibiotic therapy. So we'll, we'll know the answer to that, um, I guess, you know, in, in, in the coming year. Very you good. know, it's a good question. Okay. And uh, just quickly on that, just finishing that one, uh, we'll, what's the cell count of 344 in 2020? 
Well, and to legislation, well, my size would be an issue with, with that level of cell count and, and, um, and the new antibiotic legislation that's coming into effect next, uh, next, this time next year. Yeah, so within, within the herd, there were, um, there, there were cows that, that, like, say, when they started off their, their, their once-a-day life, like coming from a twice-a-day herd, they did have, um, um, you know, maybe a slightly higher cell count. So they, they actually have been called from the herd. We're going to repeat this um, study. So we're doing a third year of the once-a-day milking um, this coming year. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens in terms of um, the cell count this year. But like, you know, the, the cows that we've chosen, we didn't specifically choose them for um, like low cell count or for once a day milking. They were just general twice a day cows that were available to us and um, that weren't specifically chosen for, for the once a day herd. Very good. Thanks, Seymour. Uh, Michael John, back to you again. Um, Michael John, the question, uh, was there much peer pressure on you or do you feel much pressure on you to uh, start once a day? Maybe... Someone like to say, what, what would the neighbours say about you if you were making once a day? Did you find that much when you started at nine years ago now? Absolutely right, yeah. Um, everybody, had a, a, I suppose everybody had an opinion. Um, not everyone obviously probably said it to me. Uh, but yeah, it was pretty obvious um, from talking to other people. I was definitely the talk of the countryside uh, by far. Um, but surprisingly enough, too, a lot of people because who have seen the layout of the farm um, didn't think it totally unusual, even though it was an unusual system for people to get their heads around. Um, they kind of, they certainly seen the justification um, for my reasoning. But yeah, you go if you're going to go once a day, um, you're going to have to be willing to take a lot, uh, take a lot of questions, and uh, certainly be centre of attention by far. Very good, very good. Uh, just looking at your last uh, slide there on the on the cows out in the field, uh, uh, just <laughs> talking to us today. Quality grass looks, uh, it's like somebody nearly eat yourself, it's so good there. Have you have you done much uh, work over the years in, in training yourself to, to get the right covers of grass that cows go into? Yeah, um, without doubt, Brian, I think it is, I mean, it is all that boring stuff you could say now at this stage that when you go to Chugs meetings and you, you listen to advisors and they go, yo, get the grass right, do you know what I mean? Uh, concentrate on the breeding. But yeah, it, it, you do have to get almost a little bit anal about it because... Um, it does make a huge difference, you know what I mean? And especially once a day, because obviously, as Emer said, you want to get one chance in the day to actually decide more or less what you're doing. And also, I think uh, once a day cows um, definitely respond well to good grass, but at the same time, I think they do probably take a hit, uh, maybe more disproportionately, if you don't get the grass right. You know what I mean? Good. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Just a, a quick question here for myself about have, have I any have we any financial data comparing once a day and twice a day income? Um, every year at the, at the conferences in the Hearts and Jockey, we always uh, um, uh, cover that topic, uh, the income side of it. Um, so look, uh, I think uh, if we're going to hit, uh, take a 20% drop in milk solids um, yield in the first year, you're obviously going to suffer a, a drop in income. And I'll ask Michael John himself in a minute. Uh, but so, will you take a 15% drop in income then? I don't think you will because there are some savings, like um, maybe long term savings as well. You'll have more heifers or cows going back in calf for the, for the next lactation. Uh, you have um, a bit less lameness, better fertility. Uh, you'll also have some slight savings in electricity costs and uh, milking powder detergents and so on. But uh, you're going to take a drop, no doubt. And I would always warn that if you're going to go switch over to once a day milking, uh, your financial side of your, your, of your system would want to be in order. Um, if you're highly bothered, obviously you can't afford to take a 15% drop in income or thereabouts. It will vary from farm to farm, depends how much preparation one puts into it in advance of, of, of switching over to once a day. Um, just talking to George Ramsbo on there yesterday, George has a number of um, profit margins in for this year on the twice a day, and I think uh, the average uh, net profit there would be around 700 euro. Uh, cow, I think might, you mentioned that I might lose just over 620 or something there for uh, 2020. So that, that's just a difference, uh, a quick difference there. But the one thing I'll say is that the longer you stay at once a day making, I reckon it'll take about four or five years to get back up somewhere close uh, to what your income was on, um, on twice a day. I know Emma there mentioned maybe two or three years. Um, I think it would take that bit longer. But... Uh, you know, it, it, uh, it just takes a lot for that much time because the longer you stay, uh, you're calling out the codes that 
that are not super once again, you're going to keep reading from the ones that just suit. So that would be our answer, and we, we'd always say, carry this as a warning, uh, be careful about going to once a day if you have, a heavy, if you have high borrowings. Um, Michael, John, what, 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 as regards income in your case, uh, what do you think, how does it affect your income that much? I think, well, uh, look, obviously 2013, uh, your first year once a day, um, it's, it's going to catch, it's going to, there's going to be a drop there. I mean, I myself like had a 23% drop in, in milk solids, but at the same time, um, that is probably offset by the fact that I obviously I halved my milk, my ration feeding that year. And obviously there was definitely a reduction in the electricity costs, which there were two of the obvious ones. I mean, I know there's also detergent and little things like that. I think if you're changing, if you want to change over physically, you'd want to be cover, able to cover all your bank repayments um, comfortably at the moment. You know what I mean? Before you could actually probably consider um, going once a day because other than that, it, it just it could get a bit too tight if anything unforeseen um, did arise. Yeah, but you're you're obviously happy enough. You're happy with the income you yeah. have, and, and absolutely. Uh, what I'm doing now um, uh, is uh, a very good income uh, by far. And um, again, there's probably a lot of stuff that probably can't be quite quantified on the on the cost control planner. That yes. is too. Yeah, very good answer. Uh, if I just maybe leave you there with uh, just uh, I always like looking through mixed recordings and all that. And I just a quick look at yours last night. I just went to see what the highest yielding cow what she did delivered in 2020. Um, she was a cow off of GXY uh, by TIH, and uh, she delivered to the. Uh, this is on your mixed recording now. She uh, produced 659 kilos of mixed solids last year, which is a massive yield for any cow, not to mind, on, to, on once a day. And she had uh, just over 200 day lactation. And uh, she, was a, she was a fourth lactation last year, um, and she had 493 fat and 411 protein. So uh, she had a high side counter right, 279, but um, she, she's, uh, she's an exceptional cow. As a matter of interest, uh, Michael John, what can, that type of cow, what, what is she like physically to, to milk and, and other type? Um, I think uh, physically as a type of cow, um, she's a lovely cow, um, obviously. Um, look, in my when I was breeding British in 2012, I did put a lot of emphasis on um, linear scoring and things like that when I was uh, selecting bulls. So even though I was milking twice a day, I was putting a lot of emphasis on um, other strength, uh, rump width, you know, and even and good feet and legs, which I think probably have stood to me in my transfer over to once a day, because obviously once a day puts a lot of pressure on uh, others. Um, like, I mean, I'd have a, maybe a dozen cows there this year who would have probably peaked in the mid thirties liters um, in their peak years. That's a lot of milk to be carrying in in, in the bag. Um, overall, her milking speed is quite good. I mean, I say her cell count's a little bit high, but yet she's not a troublesome cow uh, by any means. Yeah, and all that. And I just come to submit and I finish off on this. Uh, that cow also had a very high EBI of one ninety eight. And I just had a quick look there. Um, of the highest EBI cow in your herd, and the highest EBI cow in your herd is a, an EBI of 227. She's a first calver. She actually delivered, she produced 395 kilos of mixed size last year, right? Lost to 400 kilos in her first lactation. And she only had a set count of 67,000. Um, and she had 501 fat and 414 protein. So the point I'm just coming today, and it's been asked this previous years about uh, bull selection and bull type, and I think it has been covered in previous conferences. Generally, you, you go uh, try and pick the, the, the higher EBI bulls, and within that, then you'll be looking at things like, uh, I suppose, uh, other, others and, and suspensory ligament and his uh, resistance and so on. But uh, so, look, the EBI is, seems to be working, um, and, 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 and that's uh, good to know. Okay, we'll, we'll have more questions again, Michael John, later on for you. So now we'll move on to our, our, our last. And thank you again, Michael, for, the, for that excellent presentation. So we'll come back to you again when, the, when Nick is finished. So now, folks, uh, thank you again. So now, folks, we'll, um, we'll move on to our final speaker, uh, Dr. Nick Snedon. Uh, he works with Fonterra Co-op uh, near, uh, I think, is near Palmerston or, or Massey University in the North Island. And uh, Nick, I was lucky enough to be in New Zealand on two separate occasions, 1995 and 2006, uh, with, uh, with farmers, uh, groups of, a group of farmers from Waterford. Uh, we have this thing going where we go off every year with, uh, with farmers uh, on, on farm trips. And uh, when we got to New Zealand, the New Zealand farmers just couldn't understand how um, Irish farmers could spend two weeks away or more from their farms. So, Nick, uh, with that, I, I hand over to you. Yep. Um, well, yeah, growing up on a dairy farm, I certainly found uh, mum and dad, I think, in the last 30 years, my father's had 
at most a month off the farm in total. Um, but you know, he's only turn, turning 72 this year, so he's still milking twice a day. Very good. Um, so what I plan to uh, take you guys through here is just sort of our journey that we had at the Massey University Dairy Farm as we transitioned from a, well, it was quite a complex system. So that was a split calving herd. So we calved autumn and uh, spring, and we were calving around about 380 cows across that. Uh, the farm is 140 hectares in size, um, and it's a lovely elongated L shape. Uh, so it's got about three and a half kilometers of riverfront, um, and it's only about 800 meters wide at its widest point. Um, so the cows can end up walking two and a half kilometers to three kilometers uh, to the cow sheet and back uh, when they're walking twice a day. So in 2013, uh, the decision was made on the farm uh, to transition. Uh, so we took it from 380 cows down to 270 cows. Um, and in doing so, um, it was pretty much they were going to carve in July. Uh, we actually sat down and had a meeting in May to work out which cows we were going to keep and uh, transition through into once a day. Uh, so when we did that, we sat down, we looked at what we had for records. Uh, so they were milk production records, somatic cell count records. And uh, we actually went out and physically looked at the cows uh, at that time of year. It's got a lot of information. You know, the other has actually got to its full involution and you can't actually tell how good they're going to hold up. Um, but this is in the background there, uh, actually a picture of the farm. And these are the cows in a from their second season, 2014. Um, just behind those trees is the Manawatu River, uh, and this farm is on a very uh, light river soil. Um, so we have to watch our nitrogen loading on there because you know, it's less than 300 metres into the river for anything coming out of those cows. Um, and then once we transition into once a day, those cows were then screened again for confirmation squid traits uh, within four months of calving, uh, just so we knew if they're going to handle it for the rest of the season. Um, the ones that didn't handle it for the rest of the season, um, they actually went off to the other Mass University farm for uh, twice a day milking and keeping them going. Um, so cow number wise, there's currently uh, 70 Holstein Frisians, uh, 60 Jerseys and the balance. So about 130 cows are crossbred. Uh, so what would be called a Kiwi cross in New Zealand. So Holstein Jersey crossbred cow. So when we moved across, um, we did a couple of mating management changes as well. So they had been getting a 14 week mating in spring. Um, so first season in, that was cut immediately from 14 weeks to 10. And that was all done with AI. Um, so no use of bulls, all in shed mating. Um, that season we were able to choose our bulls and select them based on a set of breeding values for once a day traits, um, which we took as uh, other, uh, other the concentration of the milk, so getting more fat and protein per litre, because we knew we were going to get a drop in volume, um, as well as some other traits, so yeah, keeping udder support up, front udder, rear udder, teat placement. Um, we also selected for capacity, which is the amount of heart room the cow has. Uh, and when we're doing our mating on this farm, uh, we use minimal interventions. Uh, so in 2017, we did a study uh, comparing this farm and the twice a day farm. Uh, the twice a day farm was using 30% uh, intervention for mating. Uh, this farm used 3% intervention. Um, so we had a, just, if the cow couldn't get in calf, the cow wasn't going to get in calf. We weren't going to try and uh, force the system or alter it in any way. So from our mating performance over uh, these, these are the last six seasons that I had records for. So we're getting almost 100% submission in our first three weeks of mating. We're getting a six week in calf rate of around about 80% and finishing out at an empty rate of 9%. Um, doesn't sound great, uh, but our average herds in New Zealand are sitting around about uh, 15 to 16% empty on twice a day. And then we're still managing to get them all carved within nine weeks. So 10 weeks of mating, nine weeks of calving, 
get it over and done with nice and quick um, and then have the benefit of only having to uh, be kicked by a heifer in the morning uh, and you get the afternoon for your hands and your arms to have a rest before you go back and find a new heifer the next day. Um, so in comparison between uh, what we see in once a day farms across the country and twice a day farms, uh, so the once a day herds are having about 10% higher in calf rates at six weeks. They've got a 5% lower uh, empty rate, you're getting seven, seven to eight percent higher submission rates in three weeks, eight percent uh, higher for first carvers, so and a eight percent higher conception rate overall. Uh, so from memory, that's sitting around about the mid 60s to low 70 percent conception rate, and this is all being done in a shorter overall mating window. So this is being done in five days fewer. Um, again, it's an extra week where you're not in the cow shed looking at tail paint, drafting cows off, um, and you can start to get into some of the more cruisy part of summer. Uh, so milk production, of course, we took a hit. Um, so this is comparing the twice a day farm at Massey with the once a day farm. Um, so we're looking sitting around about 350 kilos per cow for milk solids. Um, before the transition, we were sitting around about 390, 380 for this herd. And the twice a day farm up the hill, uh, so they're sitting around about 400 most of the time, uh, a couple of years where they pop up to about 450. Uh, we're trying to keep the cows smaller in size. Um, we want to actually constrict that um, cow size, keep them sh a bit smaller, um, which is, Part of trying to keep our cows um, sort of confirmation how we want it um, and reducing the amount of feed going into maintenance versus uh, going into production. It should be said that this farm is um, self-contained. Uh, there's no imported feed. Everything these cows are getting is coming off the milking platform itself. Um, so in 2018-19 dairy season, uh, we had quite a severe drought here in the Manawatu. Uh, we basically had no grass production from, well, we stopped getting rain at the start of December and we didn't get uh, decent rain again until April. Uh, so we had three months basically of nil grass growth um, and we still managed to do 320 kilos of milk solids from those cows. But we are looking at you know, about a 20 to 20% 20 drop uh, relative to the herd up at the twice a day farm. Um, so again, national data is showing the same story. Uh, we're looking at around about 15 to 25% uh, drops in milk production. Uh, so that is uh, milk volume. And then the difference is, is greater in the Holstein Frisians and our Jersey type cows. Um, so 25% in the high producing Holsteins, whereas it's only a 17% drop from the Jerseys. Um, and that volume drop is always greater than the milk solids drop. So whilst we may lose 25% of the milk volume, we're actually only going to drop about 18% on milk solids. Um, just a sign that the milk going to the factory has a bit more in it. Uh, relating to that, we've also found that the milk from cows being milked once a day uh, has higher levels of lactoferrin in it. Um, and our lactose... Uh, appears to be holding steady. Um, I was, it's quite curious to see that you guys are seeing a drop off in lactose from once a day milking, but ours have uh, held up. Uh, so our main area of selection on these cows is keeping uh, the udder and the confirmation there. Um, when we can transition, this herd had had no selection at all based on udders. They were a commercial herd. Um, they just got the bull that was available um, and the cows were removed on fertility somatic cell count basis um, and there was no uh, keeping them in or out based on their udder. So over the time, uh, cow you know, is walking around with 60% more milk in her udder than she would have in a, a twice a day system. That's a lot of pressure to be putting on those suspensory ligaments and uh, during, certainly during spring, uh, the worst thing can happen. And of course, that middle suspensory ligament goes and you have a poor cow who's walking along and she's um, kicking herself as she goes. 
So that's why we've made selecting on other our, uh, one of our key traits within here. And as well as that, it's been important to make sure that we're making regular and consistent scoring of that confirmation. Um, I've now been scoring the cows on the property for eight years. Uh, this will be my ninth season scoring them. Um, and it's just to make sure that someone uh, mainly unbiased uh, comes along and does the scoring. Uh, we want to make sure that the scores are always done by the same person. I, it's my impression of the cow on the day when I get there. Um, generally, they've been milked, so the udder is not under complete pressure, but you get the shape and uh, sort of the feel for how the udder is holding up to the lactation. It's generally done either in December or January, uh, so they're off peak milk, so we can see what, hap what stresses have been placed on that udder during the peak milk period. Within that, um, so there's 14 traits that I score, so that are uh, the stature, height of the cow, weight of the cow, from a visual assessment, capacity, which is heart room, rump angle, rump width, legs, are they curved, are they straight, does she stand up very tall, um, the rear udder, the front udder, front teat and rear teat placements, udder support, how well is it held up, um, the overall uh, udder, so would you be happy to see that udder at four o'clock in the morning, um, or is that something that's going to make you want to go back to bed and just pull the covers over your head? Um, dairy confirmation, how well is that cow going to do as a milking cow every year and body condition score? Um, so those are all one to nine traits. Most of them have a, either a five or a nine as our optimal level. And then the farmer uh, will score four other traits, which is the adaptability to milking, shed temperament, milking speed, and overall opinion. Those tend to be scored at the either end of the spectrum where the cow is either very much liked or very much not liked. Um, we don't see many scores across our national system for it, uh, where cows get a six or a seven or a three or a four. They're either a one or a nine. Um, and even in there, there's some bias because the absolute worst cow is not going to get scored at all. Uh, she's gone within four to five weeks of calving. Uh, so it's sort of self-limiting for her. Um, so just a couple of examples of what we're, we're looking to score. Um, so I've highlighted in red the sort of uh, traits that we're looking for when we score the cow. Um, but we have capacity, udder support, and front udder. Uh, we want to avoid the, it looking like the cow's udder is falling off her. Uh, and some real-time pictures. Uh, so on the left-hand side of the screen are uh, two actually quite nice little udders on cows. Uh, in the middle there is what you get sort of as the udder starts to let go. And then on the, uh, on the right hand side there is an udder that has completely gone. Um, I'm not actually sure how that calf is getting in there to drink, um, but where there's a will, there's a way. And um, these are some of our cows that we actually have on the farm. This is a picture I took uh, two years ago while scoring them. So these are udders on cows as they've held up um, over the time. And as you can see, we've got quite a licorice all sorts uh, mixed bunch in here to choose from, from very Jersey to very Frisian. Um, overall, our scores aren't changing a lot. They're actually holding. Um, but our first carvers, uh, so the average of the herd, I should say, is um, 6.1 for other support. And our, our first carvers have gone from that average of 6.1 to carving with a other score other support score of 7.7 .7, .7, which with a nine is an ideal they can drop two two unit scores on that and still be the average of the herd um, as well as that our other uh, other overall scores have also gone from six to seven and a half again giving us that buffering area within there and the six-year-old cows so you know we've got cows on this farm that are now 13 years old so they were never selected for once a day when their mating decisions were being made. These are cows that have you know, they've had it thrust upon them. Um, and even they have had the other scores go from uh, 5.2 up to 5.7 for other support and 5.3 has actually dropped down to 4.9 for other overall. And for most of those cows, it's that their teats are starting to migrate out towards the outer, outer edge of the udder. So while it's held up, the teats have gone out. Um, however, these cows are getting older and they're staying in this system for longer. Um, 
we've, we've got a replacement rate of around about 19% in the herd. Um, and some of the attrition that happens isn't actually cows being culled. They are cows that we've decided aren't suitable and they leave this farm and go to the twice a day herd. Uh, so as I said, there's always going to be these pressure on the udder. Um, we want to make sure that as those pressures are happening, we're maintaining strong selection to make sure that it doesn't get away on us. Um, there can be some quite hard decisions being made. Um, it can be quite uh, terse sometimes when we sit down with our farm manager on the property and say, this is the cow we want to remove based on her udder. And they go, it's a cow I really like. And we say, uh, you, know, you have to go through the process of, it's a cow you like, um, but for her sake, next year, her udder is going to have fallen off or not be very much uh, fun for you in the cow shed or for her to walk to the cow shed. Um, so it's just making sure that you have to make those hard decisions on animals. Um, and the other thing that we have learnt um, is that your mating decisions have to predate this transition by two years. Um, so we made the decision and they carved three months later. There was no way we could get uh, the best bulls for that system then. Uh, if we'd had the time to transition, we would have started mating our cows for once a day, uh, probably two to three seasons before with the transition just so that our heifers, when they calved, were going to be ready for it, um, able to hold up to it better. Um, so a couple of closing points. Um, you know, our fertility's gone up. Our comp cow confirmation is improving. Um, the farmer time is improving immensely for them. Uh, so they milk at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, they've got the rest of the day to do stuff. And it is one, uh, one person milking 250 cows by themselves. Um, and they can have one relief milk staff come in, get every other weekend off. Um, relief staff are quite easy to get hold of. You say, you know, you're going to have to milk the cows once or twice on a weekend at six o'clock, um, as opposed to we're going to have you here four times. You'll be here at 4.30 in the morning, and then you'll be here again at 2.30 in the afternoon. Um, it doesn't leave you with a great deal of your day on the weekend, um, so you can get that outside farm staff a bit easier. Um, the negatives, of course, we've seen decrease in production um, and we're having to alter our pasture management uh, on the farm. So we had to, lo we lowered the stocking rate. So we used to be around about three cows to the hectare. We're now just over two. Um, so we've seen our residuals uh, creeping up. Uh, so they're probably coming out, what on a New Zealand system would be about 1,900 to 2,000 kg of dry matter a hectare, which uh, from a rough guess for the Irish system would probably be coming around, coming out of the paddock between uh, five to five and a half centimetre residual. So we're getting quite high up there. Um, but that's a problem that we're having on our farm. Uh, farmers across the country have uh, mitigated that by just keeping their stocking rate the same as I've done the transition. And then, as always, uh, there's something to be said for um, going and taking your system slowly and working your way through it. Um, you know, as you can see, the cart and the horse here, uh, you know, you know, have stood the test of time. Um, the building itself behind them was only built in 2015. So uh, that's what happens when farmers get a bit more time on their hands. Um, they can actually have a bit of fun. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Nick, for that. That's an excellent presentation also and, and a, a very different one uh, to what we've been used to. You're the first time we had someone from New Zealand speaking at a once-a-day conference. And I thank you for that and also maybe make people realise that it's now a 13-hour difference between us and, and New Zealand. It's now 20 past uh, 12 um, in the morning and it's your, yeah. second, it's your second time in two days doing this with us. Yeah. I was going to say, welcome to Friday. Oh, yeah, good. Good on you. Um, yeah, and, and uh, I, I don't have too much sympathy in one way for you because you just told us earlier you have 28 degrees uh, centigrade, lovely weather. And um, I suppose just to, just to make people uh, realize that uh, your January is equivalent to our month of July and it's in the middle of your summer there at the moment. Yeah. Yep. Isn't it? Yeah, so um, it's currently still 19 degrees. So, oh, yeah. yeah, you couldn't, it'd be hard to sleep, Nick, with that kind of temperature, in fairness. So you're as well off to be up here. Um, yep. 
So look, you've covered a lot of very interesting uh, stuff there, and uh, there's a share of questions after coming in. Um, if I might just uh, just get to starting off there, you just you did mention there that you're making decisions to be two years previous to when um, to when you think you start once a day making. Do you put a lot of emphasis on that? Yes, um, so that, that's become uh, quite a bit of um, communication coming from myself and um, the other researchers who were involved in this project at Massey. So Nicholas Lopez and Danny Donaghy. Um, so we quite often tell people, you know, think about when you want to transition and um, start your mating appropriately. So if you want to transition, say, in 2026, um, you've probably got a couple of years to think about it. If you're going to transition in 2023, you should be mating those cows this year for once a day. Very good. And uh, also, you're, you do put a fair lot of emphasis on, on the other other suspensor ligament, teeth placement, particularly front teeth placement. Has that affected maybe the gain in, uh, in milk yield uh, because you're putting so much emphasis on the other quality? Yeah, so um, we've almost um, tried to hold our milk production. Um, so we're trying not to push it up, um, just not to undo what we've done for the udder. Um, so we could probably uh, start to ease off on the udder now and put more onto the uh, milk production, but it's trying to keep that balance right. And we feel that uh, you know, 350, 360 kilos of milk solids isn't actually bad under a New Zealand system for once a day. Um, our national average milk production is 380 kilos of milk solids. So we're only down by 30, um, but these cows are going to hang around a bit longer. Very good. That's, yeah. And Nick, maybe it's a fair question to ask you, but at 350 kilos of mixed solids per cow approximately, how would income-wise compared to twice-day farmers, how would the income, have you any idea how the income would compare? Uh, so 350 versus the average, um, you'd be down about $180 New Zealand. Uh, so divide it by, or multiply it by 0 0.7 for turning it into a euro. Mm. So you'd be about, down about 120, 130 euros. Okay. Okay, Nick, thank you for that. Uh, okay, I'll just move on to some uh, questions from the, from the audience. Um, right. Okay, Nick, um, have you ever seen um, a large herd split into, into, into two milkings? Um, Half once a day and the other half and twice a day, half the other half of the herd and twice a day to make better use of, I, I presume it's facilities or milking powder? Yep, um, so that one's uh, fairly common. Uh, so it's often done with heifers in New Zealand. So the heifer will spend her first season once a day. So first carver once a day and they'll be milked in the morning with the main herd and in the afternoon you'll milk the older cows uh, again. Um, Part of that is to uh, reduce the strain on the workers. Um, the other part is also to reduce the strain on the cow. Um, so she's still growing. You want to make sure you're going to get her in calf. Best way to do that is to improve her energy balance. Once a day, a bit of energy balance you're getting through. Um, the other thing that happens, so we've got a couple of farms in New Zealand that are milking two to 3,000 cows. Um, so what they do is they actually split and milk 1,500 cows in the morning and 1,500 cows at night. And the other benefit there is the neighbours don't know that you're milking once a day. <laughs> Very good. Okay. All right. Um, Nick, I, 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 like I suppose um, New Zealand, you've been practising once a day milking for a lot longer than we have in Ireland. I think it starts somewhere in, the, in New Zealand around 1940s or 50s. But um, are, 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 are more farmers heading that way, milking once a day for the entire lactation? And even for parking? Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, full lactation. Uh, so through the 90s, it was sort of 1% to 2% of farmers were doing it. Um, into the 2000s, it started to actually increase. As the milk price came up, you could uh, milk the cow less often, get less milk, but get the same amount of money. Um, so you didn't have to do it. Um, so we saw it rise up to about 5%. It's sitting around about 8 to 9% full lactation uh, once a day now and then uh, it's become quite common for farmers after Christmas or after New Year's so um, after the peak milking and going into the hottest part of our summer um, to go to once a day so you milk in the cool of the morning you can put the cows out into the paddock they don't get the heat stress of coming back onto the hot concrete in the afternoon 
um, and you don't get the heat stress of going into the cow shed at uh, three o'clock in the afternoon with peak peak sun and peak heat. Very good, Nick. Uh, another question here for you. Um, financially and environmentally, how is the dairy one comparing? Uh, so financially, it is uh, pretty much on par with the twice a day herd. So the twice a day herd has uh, a lot more costs uh, associated with it. So income wise and uh, a gross profit wise, they are comparable. And uh, environmental wise, it has improved the environmental impact of the farm. Uh, the other farm has actually gone to having a controlled duration grazing. So there's a cow barn up on that property. And during autumn, those cows are off pasture. Um, so they're probably comparable in the uh, environmental impact, but the cost of having offset that environmental impact was much higher for the twice a day herd. Good. And actually, another question there from, from Gillian O'Sullivan is, uh, why reduce the stocking rate for the once a day herd? Why do you actually reduce uh, Yeah, um, so when we were milking those 380 cows, um, when you put that number over the whole season, it was a stocking rate of three, um, but we were carving, I think it was about 220 cows in autumn and 160 cows in, uh, 220 cows in spring, 160 cows in autumn. Um, so it was effectively keeping the stocking rate the same or increasing it for spring. And we removed um, the extra feed that was required for those cows during those other months. Um, we probably could still increase the herd size on the property some more um, just to maintain and pasture quality and allow us to do it with grazing instead of having to use tractors and mow and top. Um, but that comes with a environmental impact as well. So we're trying to reduce the number of the amount of urine on the property, basically. Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Um, so look, at this stage, I'll just uh, show open some questions to all the three speakers. Uh, one to Michael John there, Michael uh, John, what would you, what would your typical length of lactation be? Uh, generally, Brian, I'd probably around uh, 280, 290 uh, days. Uh, most cows can actually get to 300 days um, when I'm drying them off, to be honest. So yeah, I think you were discussing earlier, do you have about a good a, a good six week uh, dry period at, around that time? True, I do. I that period, yeah. this year on the 18th of December. Uh, do you give cows full allocation of grass after milking or, or every 12 hour blocks? Uh, I much prefer to uh, give them a full day's allocation and during this mid-season I probably prefer the 36, 48 hours of kind of the third or fourth grazing is the grazing that I try and tighten them up on but I do go generous at the start, yes. Okay, and uh, why not Why not crossbreed? Um, very simply. At the st when I first started in 2013, I didn't really have anybody to ask about what was happening. Um, I only knew one farmer milking once a day. I had no idea that it was going to work. So, and to be honest, I really had, I really just liked the cows that I have. Uh, and again, look, I had financial performance. I had, you know, bills to pay and things like that. So I, I felt I was changing a lot, going from twice a day to once a day into the unknown. And really, I thought, starting to change cows, change cow type, change cow breed. It just felt like uh, way too much. But no, I don't have any great desire for crossbreeds anyway. I have, I'm able to offload calves, so I don't really worry about that aspect. So you're, you're, not, you're not going to change at this stage either, yeah? At this stage, I'm afraid not, no. Okay, very good. Uh, Emer, um, Emer, you mentioned there actually some, uh, I thought was very interesting uh, question there about that there was no drop there was no difference in the drop in yield between first calvers, first lactation, and, and, mat and more mature cows. The perception would always have been that heifers would, would be hit harder, hit hardest, and uh, would suffer a bigger drop than mature cows. So you, yeah, you yeah. Uh, no, like we we've actually analysed it for for both 2019 and 2020, and the same the same we found the exact same thing. So the proportionate drop um, of heifers on once a day compared to twice a day is the exact same as the mature cows, um, and that's two years in a row. So you know I'm doubtful we'd find it again. Right, and I suppose again there are some comments there. Um, last year in 2020, you fed the cows with 330 kilos per cow. Um, do you think you could get away with less because they're milking once a day? It's come back to me with a similar question previously. 
Uh, yeah, we potentially could could get away with less, I guess, um, towards the back end of the year, like a lot of farmers around the country, we didn't hit um, the targets for, um, you know, for peak, for peak covers um, or that. So there's pros and cons to that too. We do quality grass, but equally we had to increase the um, supplementation level. So, you know, potentially we, we could have done it on, on, on less. As I say, concentrate input depends completely on the um, grass availability. Very good. Thanks, Seymour. Uh, Michael John, what's the cut-off point in kilos of mixed solids for a cow and a heifer to breed from? Or which cows did uh, you not breed from? Yeah. bit cheeky in that front, Brian. Um, I just breed freezing for the first four weeks, so um, I don't actually have a cut-off point. I mean, I'm a bit probably a bit cheeky maybe in that point. I'm just trying to, I'm breeding from the cows that are calving down in the first four, or come in heat in the first four weeks of season. So I'm afraid I don't really have, but I probably would say, um, I don't really have that many low ones now at the moment, to be honest. Do you know what I mean? But I, okay. I and uh, and the final question for you, Michael John, is um, contract heifer rearing. You practice, con uh, you, you, you have contract heifer rearing, and uh, does it make sense with fragmented land? Um, in other words, you've your outside blocks, why can't you use those? For absolutely. Um, yes, um, look, it, it probably does hit the overall income a small bit because obviously you're technically paying for a labour unit to run those heifers. The practical, the very simple practical day-to-day -day issue for me is the fact that for me to, me to move animals from different fields, I have to bring them out on the public road. And to be honest, it's much easier with me and my parents to move cows on the road than trying to move uh, calves and young stock on the road. So it's sheer practicality rather than actual financial. Very good. Okay. And finally, the last question there to you, Nick, is um, um, maybe before I go to the last question, uh, there's just a general question or a comment. And it just says, uh, five years ago, I lost half the herd to TB. Compensation is based on volume and it hit us hard. The parpenter I caught seemed to be Seem, uh, deemed me to be a part-time uh, to be a part-time farmer due to milking once a day. Has this viewpoint changed within the department? So it's a question, it's a comment that I can't uh, re really answer at this stage. Um, we, it would look to me that be totally unfair um, to be um, to be kind of a pit out of, uh, for being a once a day farmer and to be that there seems to be fairly negative on it. Probably a lot of it too is that People don't know much about once-day milking. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't uh, know what's involved. Maybe the, the volume fact, the fact that the volume of milk was, uh, was decreased in once-day might have hit the value of the animals, but it looks seems to be a bit unfair and maybe more people need to be educated on the, the whole t area of once-day milking. That's all, that's all I can say about that one. Um, Nick, I, I can say from a New Zealand perspective um, that have, they've got the same value in our system. Um, so they basically get a cull cow price um, plus some extra for having to be replaced. Um, so they just end up having what would be called book value. Um, so it doesn't matter if they're once or twice a day here. And uh, all right, Nate, before we close, the final question to you uh, about how do you, how do you, what's your criteria for bull selection for, uh, for once a day milking? And you, you hey, um, so our bulls, uh, so we're choosing uh, the best bulls we can for uh, the cow so sometimes we sit down and we try and balance them so if the cow has very high uh, other values herself we'll choose a bull that's got better milk production and I hope that that balances out quite nicely um, but generally we want uh, high udder support a good rear udder and front udder um, breeding value and then we go for um, a positive milk fat and protein and a relatively or a breed relative negative on milk volume. So we're still trying to keep that volume down, but we want to get a bit more out of the milk. Okay, Nick. Thank you very much. Listen, folks, uh, we're, we're uh, about to finish it at this stage. And uh, before I thank all the speakers, i just say that to recap, uh, there are different reasons, many different reasons why people are, are, have taken up milking once a day. And not everyone actually will be chasing the last penny out of it. A lot of farmers maybe would see... Uh, is it as a way towards retirement. They don't want to give up milking cows, but they don't want to milk in twice a day either. And uh, they're quite happy doing it at, at, at average enough milk yield levels. Um, and as another farmer said, how would you put a value on your time off, uh, whether it's for family or for pursuing your own hobbies or interests? And, and some farmers are, are quite happy to take a, a drop in income uh, if it means a better quality of life. And 
and and, and uh, on the other side, then you have farmers like Michael John there, and um, uh, that have, have, are getting excellent yields and up there with the twice their farmers because they're staying with them over a number of years. So look, it's, it's different different sorts of different folks. I, 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 I I'd imagine. Um, and there's actually another another good point that some farmers said um, for keeping the younger generation farming. Uh, if they see their, their fathers or their mothers having a good lifestyle, it helps them to take on the job as well. So there's different reasons there. Over the years, this is our fourth year, as I said, having this one today conference in 2018. And I'd like to pick it to thank the different farmer speakers over the years because, uh, you know, it's great to see farmers out there making a success of it. In 2018, we had Donald Lachlan there from Tipperary who spoke at the conference that year. The following year, in 2019, we had Declan White and Louise from Cork, and we had Gillian and Neil O'Sullivan there from Waterford, and uh, Ed Payne from Ross Common. And then last year, we had Catherine and, and Liam Miller from Tipperary and uh, Keith Davis, a farmer from the UK. So I, I think a, a great thanks is due to all those farmers uh, who give us all their figures, um, good and bad, and otherwise, uh, both the physical and financial performance. Um, so uh, again, Thanks again this today for <clears throat> to you, Emer, uh, to, to Michael, John, and, and to Nick. Uh, we really appreciate you you taking the time out and, and doing the, all the preparation you put into your talks. Um, and finally, then, I just want to thank uh, Stuart Childs. Stuart is our technical man here who solves all the problems, and also John Transbottom, uh, um, who who's helped us uh, put all this together, and Pat Mylan, Michael John's uh, advisor. Um, before I finish, there I, I just meant as a comment came in there. But uh, a client of mine, Gillian Neil O'Sullivan and Catherine Millick up in, um, in Tipperary, they both have put in cluster flush systems, which has helped to greatly reduce the cell count on their farms. And it's something uh, our own milk specialist, uh, quality milk uh, specialist, Don Crowley, would advocate big time. Even though it's costly, it does, it does seem to work very well. Um, so with that, I thank you all for your attendance. It's, I think it's my last conference uh, uh, doing this. And uh, I thank, thank you all for your attention.